honored to be here to speak to my old friends, the Hmong people. I, when I graduated from from college, I had already been a soldier in World War II, and uh, I was recruited by the CIA. <clears throat> by the CIA, <clears throat> I'd never heard of the CIA, <clears throat> and. Uh, I, but I agreed to go to work for them because I <clears throat> I didn't yet have a job getting out of college, and they uh, they then I went up to Washington and went through training and all. And when I finished the training, they called me into the headquarters and said, "We're going to send you to Thailand, and we want you to train the people out there to fight guerrilla warfare because we." You know, we don't, the army is very small now. We can't send the army out there to fight the communists, so we need to teach the local people to fight guerrilla warfare against the communists. And, you know, for a young man that had never been there before, had never seen anybody, it sounded like a pretty tall order, you know, for me. But I went out, and I started working with, uh, with, the, with the Thais, and I trained these young Thai boys who were really terrific and they so I created a unit there that was like I think they were like the US Special Forces before we had Special Forces and uh, and then the, uh, the the war in in Laos started we knew that this was where the communists were going and I knew that we needed <clears throat> to go to Laos excuse me Oops. So I, uh, I I started putting uh, these the teams from this unit along the Lao border, and we talked to the people on the other side, and the people on the Thai side of the river and on the Lao side of the river were basically the same people. So we talked about what is going on in Laos among the people, not the Lao government, the ordinary people. And they all talked about it and they all and they the name of uh, of Wang Pao came up and they said Wang Pao was a, a good fighter and the people in Laos believed him and they believed that he would be the the man who would fight the communist. So I knew that uh, I had to find some way to meet Wang Pao. But I didn't know how to do it, so I went back to the U.S. Embassy. You know, they didn't know anything, but then they finally said that General Pumi, the commander of the of the Lao Army, had was in Samaniket. He had fled to Samaniket when Kong Lee made the coup in in, uh, in Laos. And they, what they said was that he had five battalions in Savaniket and that they, they, those five, that all of the money that belonged to the Lao government was in the banks in Bangkok because they didn't trust any bank in, in, in Laos. So they said they, they needed to send some money up there so Pumi could pay those five battalion salary or they'd all have to go home because they didn't have the money to support their families. So when I heard all of this, I volunteered immediately to go up and take the money and give it to Pumi. I didn't know Pumi, never met him, but I knew if I arrived with a big bag of money, I would be acceptable, you know. So I went up, so I went up and met Pumi, and he said that he was going to retake Vientiane with these five battalions. So I asked him, I said, I have these Thai teams who have excellent radio communications, they have medical technician, I would like to put a team with each one of your battalions well, you go to retake Vientiane. Because I knew these Thai boys knew everything. They would do a good job. And he said, that's a good idea. He, uh, and so they did. They went with him. And then as soon as they retook Vientiane, I went to Vientiane. And because I knew what I needed to do is to find Wang Pao, wherever he was. Nobody in Vientiane knew where he was. And so I... <clears throat> I stayed around there.
for several days, and I went to the airport every day to, to see if I could get any news of him. And finally, the same pilot who had taken me to Savannakhet came in, and he said that he had seen Mong Pao that day. In fact, he had, he had met him at this village, and he had brought his family to Vientiane because he wanted to send them to safety in Vientiane. And he showed me where he was located, and, and it just happened that these four helicopters, American helicopters, had just landed in Vientiane. So I knew I could use, I could, I hoped I could get one of those helicopters. So I went over and talked to the pilots, and they said, we can't go anywhere. We have no, we don't know anything about the country. We have no maps. Uh, we did, we can't go. But I said, you know, I know this country like the back of my hand, but I'd never been there either, of course, but I, I just lied to them and said I never, so. But they didn't want to go, but I finally went to the embassy and they said, they finally agreed to let me use a helicopter. And you know, I'd never been up there, but I had a map and I knew how to read a map, so we flew up there. And we, and when we, by the time we got up there, it was already starting to get dark, and we landed at this, I could see where they had built this strip where the Helio Courier landed. So I, I got out and ran over, and there was only one man standing near where we landed, and he was a, you know, a moon fellow, and I asked him, is Wang Pao here? Oh, said, yeah, he's around here somewhere, but, it was starting to get dark, and, I, and they had ordered me to be sure and get back, so I ran back and asked uh, the Thai team, we, Colonel, uh, Colonel Frenette was the leader, are you are all willing to stay here and try to find Wang Pao? Well, now, you know, they didn't know where they were, they'd never been there before, but he said, oh sure, no problem. So I left them there and I flew back to, to Vientiane, and, and it just happened that the director of the CIA had arrived that day and they left word at the embassy for me to go to the chief of station's house and have I had dinner with him and I just told him what had happened that day. And they said, uh, well, come on into the embassy tomorrow morning and we'll talk about it. So I went there and he told me to sit down and write a cable about everything I had said the night before. So I wrote this 18-page cable that went to Washington and uh, and then I waited, and they, it, it, but then the answer came back and said that they were willing to arm the first 1,000 Hmong. And so then I went back up to ask Bang Pao, you know, what we wanted to do, where we, what we could do. So he told us where he wanted to drop the arms. But I said I had that Thai team there, and they all started walking to try to get to, they wanted to do it at, pa, at pa, Padong. And uh, it, it would take them two or three days to get there. So then I arranged to get the weapons ready that we could drop in there when, whenever they got to Padang. So they finally got there and we dropped the, the first weapons and we armed those people. And uh, I, I believed that the Hmong would, would be good fighters. And so immediately when we got them armed, I, I was up there and they we knew then that the the the, uh, the enemy was coming up the trail to where we had dropped those weapons because they saw the parachutes dropping. So then uh, those Hmong, there was, there was I think it was 300 Hmong that we had armed. They all went out to set up an ambush for those people who were coming up. Big and you know the big battle occurred. They not, none of the of the moon people got hurt at all but they killed a lot of the enemy and they all ran away back down the mountain and I never saw anybody as happy as the moon were because they'd had this great success and that's you know that's how the war started and it, it turned out so successful that then we began to to drop the weapons until we armed the first 10,000 men and they fought extremely well and, and see, what, what happened is the communists believed that they had North Laos. But after these battles, they realized they did not have North Laos, that, that the Hmong still were still there and controlled almost all of North Laos. So it was a complete change in the war.
it was it was it was so successful that the the things that the moon had done there and it gave them you know they they begin to believe that they could successfully fight the communists and that's what you need to do is to believe in yourself and uh and then we continued to arm the moon until we actually ended up with a 35,000 man guerrilla army that fought exceptionally well but you know then what always happens in the united states is that you you have the problems of whichever party is in power if you come to a big election the other side will attack them because of the war that they're involved in that's that's what they always do no matter which side so i think at that time the uh, democrat party was in power and they began and the republicans began to attack so the 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 us government become afraid they decide to pull out of southeast asia and uh and they decide they could make a peace treaty with the communist and everything would be nice but you know if you knew anything you knew that's not true that it would not be because the communists never stuck to any treaty of any kind they ever had they just didn't do it so then they begin to attack the the moon and when all the americans left laos then the moon became frightened they didn't know what to do so that's when they all ran away and went to thailand and uh then they were trying to decide the american government was trying to decide what to do because you had those thousands of moon pouring into thailand and then they they made the decision to let the moon come to the us and uh and i was involved in all of that but it, and you know i think if you look you if you look back it's turned out you know they asked me <clears throat> before they decided <clears throat> to let the moon <clears throat> come here they asked me how do you think the moon will do in the US cuz most of them can't speak english they don't have education how will they do in the US i think i think they'll do fine cuz i said the moon while they may not have education they are extremely bright people they learn everything more quickly than any other people I have ever met. And uh so I don't believe they'll have any trouble in the US. I think they'll do fine. So they decided to let the moon came here and you know it turned out you know that I was right. <laughs> and the moon you can see by what's happened today the moon have done extremely well. They're now they're now good citizens of the US and uh I think everybody is very glad that they're here and I think they are glad they're here also. I, so I believe that uh, we've had a very happy ending to what could have been a very sad story. And I uh I I'm very happy for whatever role I might have played in in what has happened to the moon. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to tell you what i think today thank you